welcome everybody to another episode of uh, Bones and Stones. Today we're very excited to have uh, Dr. Justin Bradfield with us, uh, who's currently a, a senior lecturer at the Paleo Research uh, Institute, the University of Johannesburg. And we thought we'd have Justin on today to talk about a recent paper that he's had published online in the conversation um, about a bone arrowhead uh, from Classy's River main site uh, down in the Cape. Um, and that publication is, is from a quaternary science reviews paper, is that correct? Yes, that's right. Okay, perfect. So we thought we'd just chat to Dustin a little bit today about his research and uh, talk a little bit about the significance of this interesting find. So Justin, do you want to maybe talk us through it? Yeah, great. Uh, first of all, thanks very much, guys, for having me on. Uh, nice to be here. I've watched quite a few of the episodes already. Um, yeah, so the uh, class is River Bone Point. It's quite an interesting little find. There. It was actually excavated in 1968. Uh, first published uh, in 1982, so archaeologists in the country have known about it for quite a number of decades already. Um, but at the invitation of Sarah Wirtz, who is the current excavator of the site, I re-looked at the bone point, um, which is about 12 years after it has been looked at by Francesco Derrico and Chris Henshelwood. And what's really interesting about the bone point is it's got um, stuff adhering to the surface of it, which nobody to date has noticed or mentioned or picked up on. And when we analyzed that material with Raman spectroscopy, it showed that it's a heterogeneous substance. So it's probably poison or some sort mm. of adhesive. It's not uh, manganese oxide, which is what is usually found adhering to, to bone tools. So when we analyzed that, um, it came back as being a organic material or at least having components of an organic material and when we looked at the use wear of that bone point under the microscope we could see evidence of use wear overlying that black substance wow. and then of course the the distribution of the substance suggested that it was purposefully applied to the bone point so yeah we we think that we've got something very interesting there and based on the shape and the the use wear and the fact that it's got um, poison slash adhesive residue on it suggests that it could be an arrowhead and it dates to about 62, 64,000 years ago. Jeez, that really is, it's incredible. I mean, I know the coastal sites have, uh, you know, got very interesting, uh, um, you know, materials preserved within them, but this is incredibly interesting. Justin, could we maybe contextualize the importance of this, this, this discovery in terms of, you know, this bone point? If, if it is an arrowhead, you know, what, oh. what kind of, you know, you mentioned the conversation, uh, the origins of bow hunting is, is quite significant in the archaeological record. So what yeah. advantages, if this is, of, of course, an arrowhead, which, you know, the, the, the data suggests it is, what advantage would that have given humans uh, in the past? Right. So to contextualize that from the beginning, um, archaeologists are very interested in when people started hunting, specifically with bows and arrows. A bow and arrow represents a form of symbiotic technology, which is a quite an advanced mechanical system. So you need a certain level of intelligence in order to create a bow and arrow set. Secondly, um, adhesives and poisons are usually groups of compound recipes, and you need to know what you're doing. You need to know the pharmacological properties, the pre preparatory properties um, of these things in order to create uh, a poison or an adhesive that works. So if we can identify evidence for poisons or adhesives or bow and arrow technology in the archaeological record, it really suggests that people at that stage, whenever it might be, were functioning at a level that was not dissimilar to how modern humans today would think and would reason analogically. So the interesting thing about uh, bow and arrow hunting technology in Southern Africa is that all the evidence thus far has come from KwaZulu-Natal from sites like Umschlatazana, from Subudu Cave, where there incidentally is another bone point that's also thought to be an arrowhead. And the classes of the bone point is the first unequivocal evidence that we have that pushes this technology down into the Western Cape region of South Africa. Um, the Pinnacle Point people have published a paper looking at stone tools at about 70,000 years ago, but there was no experimental work done on that. So it's possible that we do have bow and arrow technology prior to 64,000 years ago, but this is the first 
I would say, solid evidence of that. And it's in the form of a bone tool, which, as you guys know, is quite rare in the Middle Stone Age. Jeez, that's really interesting. I've got a whole pile of questions that I want to ask you, but I'm going to hand over to, to Matt first because he's got a question for you and then I'll wait my turn. Uh, so, yeah, Matt, you've got a question for Justin. Yeah, thanks, Justin. This is incredible. Uh, just, you know, really quite stunning that um, after all this time, tens of thousands of years, um, you're, you're still finding sort of residues on these on these um, uh, bone points. Um, so I, I was just wondering, um, in terms of understanding uh, the poison and its content, are you able to sort of chemically or molecularly analyze the poison to understand if there's a particular recipe or, or what is the, the sort of current uh, background there for, for research? We certainly hope to do that in the future. So in order to do a proper chemical analysis of the poison, we need to do liquid chromatography, mass spectrometry. And that requires us to remove a sample of the poison. Now, for the purpose of the paper that appeared in Quaternary Science Reviews, we were just looking at doing a non-destructive analysis. So that we did Raman and we did XRF. So that gives us a very broad categorization of what is in the substance. And we can identify certain polysaccharides, certain organic components, carbon-based components, but we cannot at this point with that available information say what those components are. So for that, we need a much more detailed analysis and that analysis is going to be a destructive analysis. So we are waiting for a permit um, from SARA in order to be able to do that. And then in terms of getting that done, um, it takes quite a while to get results of that kind of chemical analysis. Uh, Justin, so just to, to jump on that, is that something that's done locally or is that uh, going to be, you know, sent overseas or? Yeah, so, I mean, there's several laboratories that can do that. And I've worked with, I think, three laboratories in the past. Um, at the moment, we're working with colleagues in Sweden at Stockholm to do the chemical analysis. So we'll most likely send it there. Okay, perfect. So I'm going to hand over to Tim. You've got a question? I've got, a, uh, yeah. <laughs> I've got a comment and then a question. Um, my comment is just, it's interesting that you note that with regards to the bone arrow hunting, that it's sort of a high cognitive capability. Because when we were younger, Lotto always wanted me to come to clubs with him. So that sort of all makes sense now. Uh, and then my question <laughs> is about this period in time. So if you take the period in time you're talking about, and you say there might be some early evidence at like pinnacle point, at that around about that period in time, there's a lot of innovation going on, a lot of development um, in terms of ornamentation yeah. and beads. Um, we've got you know the, the, the engraved ochre around at Lombos, you know, there or thereabouts. So for the for the you know for our listeners, what's going on at this time in our human history that all of this is happening in this sort of short span of time? Right. So the span of time that you're talking about is probably between about 74 to 58,000 years ago. It's a period of time known as the Hausen's foot. Um, and as for why we see the sudden fluorescence of innovative technologies, uh, you, you mentioned the Blombost engraved art. Uh, we've got uh, evidence of paint. We've got the bow and arrow technology. We've got heat treated silkrete. Uh, from a variety of sites who've got engraved ostrich eggshell beads um, also at this time. I don't know why we are suddenly seeing uh, this fluorescence of material culture at this period, but it certainly seems like the, the, some of the stuff that we're seeing during this period, during the Housen's Port period, tends to drop off um, later on and then only gets really picked up again with any sort of meaningful frequency in the later Stone Age period, so from about 20,000 years onwards. So it's, it's a really interesting period uh, archaeologically in Southern Africa and in Africa. And I think there are quite a few people who are working in this period to try and figure out, you know, did this just suddenly appear or can we start tracing the origins of some of these cultural innovations to just before the, the houses were period. And I think, you know, probably with more research, we are going to start picking up these technologies slightly earlier, or at least the start of them. Yeah, you know, it's, it's just such an exciting period of time because you have 
this, you have a lot of things going on. Um, you have environmental and climatic shifts occurring. Um, there's been discussions around um, a lot of this relating to different identities or different cultural groups across the landscape. Uh, I know even you know, from a rock art perspective, there's been arguments being made around um, spirituality and ritual. So it's this really interesting period in time where all these cool developments happen. It, as mm -hmm. you mentioned, it sort of drifts off and then it pitches up again you know, around 20,000 years into the latest. Right. It's just a fascinating period. Mm. Yes, absolutely. I was going to say, um, Justin, just for me, you know, zooming out again, um, why the shift to bone? If, you know, we talk about the pinnacle point evidence, for example, uh, that you mentioned, where we may have, um, you know, uh, stone tools having been used as projectile arrowheads earlier on in the record. And we do have, obviously, examples of, of stone arrowheads. Um, why the shift to stone? And, and how do the two kind of coexist where you have, let's say, the uh, production of lithic segments, which we know were probably hafted, um, you know, how, how do the two kind of um, coexist? Yeah, um, I don't think anybody shifted to bone. I think people were using bone all the time. Uh, we have evidence of bone tools in the, the early Stone Age. We have Acheulean hand axes made from elephant bone. So I think people were using bone all the time. We just don't have evidence of it because bone obviously doesn't survive archaeologically as well as stone does. Um, as for how they were using the two simultaneously, so at um, Subudu and Umschlatzazana, for instance, we have, at least at Subudu, we have bone points and we have stone segments, which are thought to have been used as hafted inserts uh, on arrowheads, so to, to create barbs or, or things like that. And we have evidence of bone and stone being used simultaneously in arrowheads in the historic record. Um, Graham Clark, I think, or Desmond Clark, sorry, actually wrote something about bone tools that had little stone segments hafted on them. And Marlies Lombard has done a lot of research looking at how these stone segments can actually be hafted onto bone arrowheads to be used as barbs. So they were probably being used simultaneously. Um, as a single weapon component, you might also have had different types of arrows for different purposes. So we know in the ethnographic record that people were using different types of arrows to hunt different types of game. Uh, and there's all sorts of uh, religious or cultural reasons for why they would have done that. Um, but Springbuck, for instance, among certain groups would have been hunted with a different type of arrow than an Oryx or a Gemsbok or something like that. Um, whether that's applied throughout history, we don't know. Um, but it's, it's possible that something like that was happening. Jeez, it's, it's so incredible, it really is. Um, yeah. I'm gonna have a, over to Matt, you got a question? Yeah, Justin, I uh, just wanted, to, so one, one of our last uh, interviewees, uh, Gerrit um, Dusseldorp, mentioned that um, you know, one of the interesting things about the, the Middle Stone Age period and, and you know, how it's different from sort of like the Middle Paleolithic in Europe is, is the potential for larger sort of social networks um, and, and how that, that sort of um, maybe created a, a bit of a, a structure for um, you know, the, the, the use of symbols um, on a, um, a, a level that was much more complex than, than you know, what, what he was sort of discussing with Neanderthals in terms of them making these sort of glues that they used to, to have stone mm -hmm. tools to, um, to presumably wooden implements. So uh, just wanted to see if you might have any opinions um, on, you, you know, like you're saying, the sort of sudden development of complexity um, and you only really see it again in the later Stone Age. Do, do you maybe have any um, insights in, into the fact that maybe that's connected to sort of like populations, uh, sizes, uh, you know, sort of complexity of group structures within these sites. Is there any, any connection there? Yeah, sure. I mean, I've got a lot of opinions, not all of them are necessarily right or accurate. Um, my, my field isn't really the Middle Stone Age proper. So, I mean, I mainly look at, at bone tools from all periods. But yeah, I mean, look, there, there could be a variety of reasons. Uh, Tim has mentioned some of it. I mean, we do have some climatic shifts, climatic changes at that period. Um, and it's quite probable that people during this time, for whatever reason, were coalescing into larger groups that facilitated this kind of innovative technology, which you don't really find in small isolated groups. Uh, if I use the later Stone Age as an analogy, 
we find much more material culture and symbolic and religious expressions in the larger aggregation phase camps than we do in the smaller dispersal phase camps. So it's quite possible that something similar to that was happening during the Howison's poor period in that people were coming together and coalescing and there was greater uh, social networking as well, which developed or, or at least led to these developments. The problem there is that would these social networks then have disbanded after the Howison's put and then got picked up again later on? We don't really know. And at this point, I don't think there is sufficient evidence to give a definitive answer. I think there are lots of hypotheses that are out there. Um, but and as far as a definitive answer goes, I don't think we are there yet. Well, Justin, thank you. Sure the question. But. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was, a, it was a very long question, possibly one of the longest questions we've ever had on an episode of Bones and Stones. <laughs> You're the one who always has the long questions. What are you talking about? <laughs> that is true. That is true. Anyways, Justin, I think we, we're coming up on time now. So I just wanted to obviously right. uh, thank you very much for, for coming through and joining us today and talking about your really interesting uh, research and stuff. And, and the significance uh, of it as well. And, you know, just, um, you know, helping us contextualize some of the previous interviews that we had as well, uh, looking at, um, you know, the just development of, of, you know, cognition and, and complex uh, technology as well, uh, and what that means in terms of our development and evolution. So mm -hmm. thanks very much. And I'm sure we'll have you on again. My absolute pleasure. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks, Justin. Great. Thanks a lot. Thanks, guys.